Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I. Hi, and welcome to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. As we gather, as we do every Friday night live. And then, of course, when we do the Bible studies, we make them available on demand throughout, throughout the, the whole series. Uh, and right now we're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. Thessalonica, where uh, this is our seventh week, seventh chapter, so to speak, in the study. And we're just blessed and glad that you can join us to be with us, to be blessed in God's Word. So before we start tonight, as I'm here with my lovely wife Alice and brother Mark, I'm going to ask Alice if you'll start us in a prayer. A good way always to start. Amen. Hallelujah, Father. We just praise you. We thank you. We bless you. We glorify your name. We're so thankful, Lord, that we have this opportunity to get in and study your word. And we thank you for the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that you're going to give us this night to carry us on through the rest of the week. And we ask you to bless everyone who joins us and those who join us later. And we ask you, Lord, to bless all those who are not feeling well and need healing. We just bless you and praise you and thank you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, as I said, we're continuing on in our study of the first letter to the Thessalonians. And we're starting tonight in the second chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 17. And I'll start by reading verses 17 and 18, okay? But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Okay. By the way, um, I think now we're all here using the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, you have a different Bible? It should still read very similar to what, what what I'm sharing here tonight. If it doesn't, you better take a look at why. Okay. Paul is writing, he says we. This is not the royal we. He's not speaking of himself as we. He was with, uh, uh, he was with, who was he with? Timothy, for one. Timothy, and in jail, he was in jail in, Thessalon in uh, Philippi. God, he was Silas. So he's here and he's talking about them. They were taken away because of the persecution when Paul went into Thessalonica and was sharing the gospel. And trouble arose immediately, which is common in Paul's life. And he had to leave there. He went from there to Berea and, and on, right? So now he's writing back to the church that he basically started in Thessalonica. In the beginning, it's this Silvanus. In the beginning of yeah. Yeah. When he says that he's taken away, that was because of the persecution, but in person, not in spirit. You know, this is a, a kind of a common expression today. You know, you're, you're not with somebody physically, but you're with them in spirit. Your heart's still with them, right? Mm -hmm. And this was Paul's heart, because when God was using him to touch other people's lives with the good news of Jesus Christ, there was a bond there, as there should be, between somebody who's ministering the gospel and somebody who responds to that gospel. That should create this bond between you, right? Mm -hmm. So he had that bond. He had that heart's desire to see. It was like he was being used of God to bring these people into new life. And his heart stayed with him, even though he had to leave, right? So he, because of that, he says, we're all the more eager with great desire to see your face. He would prefer to see them face to face. Mm -hmm. Now, th the fact is, you know, we have a lot of people tune into this Bible study from around the world. And while I am very, very blessed to be able to use this technology to share that, it's still, I have to tell you, you know, there are a lot of people out there that I would much, I, I would love to be face to face. That's right. And it's just not always possible. So, uh, but that's, my heart is to be there face to face. I love this expression. He says that 
he was all the more eager with great desire to see your face. Eager with great desire. That word desire there, you know, Paul uses that. Let me just give you one other place where he uses that. In the first chapter of Philippians, Paul says, and you know, you're probably familiar with this verse. He says, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I'm, I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. What he's saying is, you know, he, he wants to be here to do the work of Jesus Christ, but his desire, his heart's desire, is to be with the Lord. To die as Christ, to live as... To die as... I'm having a tough time here. I have to back this up. To live as Christ, to die as gain. How much did he desire that? I said he would want to be. His, his, he wanted to be doing the ministry that God has called. There's a difference between what you... What's the difference between a want and a desire? I don't know. Well, let me just tell you this. The Greek word that Paul uses here is epithumia. Now, you don't have to be a Greek scholar, but you should know that he uses that very same word very frequently in his letters. Desire? Well, no, he uses that Greek word, but it's rarely translated desire. Okay. It is commonly translated as lust. Oh. Because he generally uses this word to talk to believers about how they shouldn't have this lust for the world and the things of the world. But that's the very same word that he's using here. You know, it would be interesting just to, to transpose and use either one consistently through it. So imagine if Paul said here, you know, I lust to see your face. It makes it sound stronger. But we, we have a very negative connotation towards lust. That's probably well we should. But what, what happened if we went back and translated all those places where he's talking about, okay, you know, you shouldn't lust after the world and the things of the world. Just change to say, as it's translated here, and say, you shouldn't desire them. Because that's even, in our culture, milder. As oh, a milder much, much, much milder. And that's why I want to bring this out. Because when Paul talks about his desire to be back with the people that God has used, he is talking about this is a lust, this is a passion. This is a burning desire. I like that word, passion. It is. It is. It's not just some, you know, I, as a matter of fact, I was talking about this Sunday at services. I was sharing this at services, talking about, uh, you know, that, that faith is the, the assurance of things hoped for. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people out there, people don't understand that word hope here as it's used scripturally. Because it's like, there are a lot of people out there, they hope they win the lottery. Now that's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about. And that surely is not based on faith. I'll tell, I'll tell you what. But it's like, you know, to have this assurance of what you what you hope for. Paul had a hope. But what was his hope? His hope was to serve the Lord above all. That's why his want, I, I, he chooses, he said, I want to stay here and serve the Lord. But his passion, his desire, his great desire, the desire that drives him is to be with Jesus Christ physically. He'd like to physically be with them, but his great desire is to be with the Lord. This is an important thing. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not just uh, treating this lightly because you really need to think about this. Because when we start talking about us Christians and think about the things that we hope for, think about, think about the things that we wish for, think about the things that we desire, and think about the things that we have this passion for, this burning desire for, because that's what Paul is talking about here. I think there's very few Christians that have a passion. I mean, there's just a very, very few. Well, now, are you talking about your experience here in the Western world? Yes. Okay. Because that's, I want to tell you something. That, that is a statement. While, while Paul wrote and said that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that's a statement that I can't quarrel with. But it's almost like a condemnation mm -hmm. of the state of the church. Yes that we don't have this passion. Just think about these verses. And I, I know that you've heard this verse, but you've probably heard it misused and abused. From Psalm 37, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, 
and he will give you the desires of your heart. So, you know, I, there are so many people out there preaching and talking about, well, you know, if you'd like yourself in the Lord, he's going to give you the, the Mercedes you want, or he's going to give you that big house or that job you want. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about the world and the things of the world. And it is not talking about a wish. You know, it, it's like when you delight yourself in the Lord, that's what God desires us to do. Think about this, just thinking about the things of the world, all right? And, you know, the Word of God, Paul wrote and said, let a man examine himself. You need to think about it and examine your own self. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And see what the true desires of your heart are. What, what, what is it that you really, really want? Because if it's the things of the world, one of the most precious things in the world today, and one of the most stable things in the world today, is gold. Yet way, 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 way back when, God spoke through Job, and here's what he said. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness from your tent and place your gold in the dust, and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will be your gold and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. When you take, and the, the gold of Ophir was known throughout the world for its purity, and it's, it's you know, it's, it was, had this reputation. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, throw that away. And then you'll delight in the Lord. He'll become what's precious to you. Okay? Think about this verse. Thy word is, a, this isn't the verse I was going to say, but thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We are supposed to be guided by God's word. Right? Mm -hmm. The Psalms also say this, Whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you, I desire nothing on earth. How many of us can say we desire nothing on earth? Now, all of this stuff is, it's, you know, it's there as a tool, it's there to be used, it's there, it's there to be enjoyed, by the way. Absolutely. But it's not something, this is not where our desire is supposed to be set. That's why Jesus could say, store up your treasures in heaven. Set your mind on the things above. I mean, these are the expressions. Yes, it's all right. You know, hey, get them, get blessed by them. But where is your desire? You can live where is your delight? It. Can you live without it? Where is your delight? Where is your desire? Where is that heartfelt passion? That burning desire? These men of God had a burning desire for their relationship with the Lord. And that's why, if you understand what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If this is what you're after, he said, don't worry, all the rest will be taken right. care of. Right. It'll be there. It's not that God says you can't have stuff. What he's saying to you is the stuff is not what you should be focused on, and the stuff is not important. And God will give you peace, God will give you joy, regardless of what amount of stuff you have or don't have. That's true. But it's Him you're supposed to be seeking. It's Him you're supposed to be desiring. Not the world and the things of the world. And brother, if you don't know that's clear in Scripture, you haven't spent enough time in the Word of God. Okay? And that's, a, I believe, a process when you get saved. Because we're, I mean, we're so engulfed in the world, it's, we're surrounded by everything. And that's how we've been brought up, that those were the important things. And then when you get saved and Christ is replacing that, it's like a, it's like a process because you well, have to... It's by the renewing of your mind. Yeah, but, and part of the reason for that is that you are besieged, mm -hmm. you are attacked, you Constant. are bombarded constantly, that's right. day and night, with the world trying to get you to desire the world and the things exactly. of the world. It's called advertising. It's right. trying to engulf well, you in that, well, and, and you're raised on that, that's and that's the tendency of the human flesh anyway. But, but you understand, this is, this is what the world is all about, getting stuff. And this is what advertising is about. This is our, this is our worldly culture. You know, we're sitting here, and as we do this study, this uh, Occupy thing is going on, not just, it's going on around the, the world. world. Right. And it's like, okay, it's a cry. I don't know, I'm not going to necessarily, I'm not going to sit here and say I agree with this cry because it doesn't have a spiritual appraisal of the situation yeah. at all. Yeah. But, the, but the fact of the matter is, it comes out of a culture that was based on greed. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. But that greed is necessary to keep the economy going. One of the reasons that the economy is faltering now, and you know, I, I believe this is, uh, I, I believe this is the judgment of God, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like we have been raised on you need to consume, you need to consume. This is what drives the economy. That's right. And in order to keep you consuming. They have to build desire in you. That's what advertising is about. It's about building desire. Okay? What happens when you are cut from that? And the thing you desire is the Lord God Almighty. And you are freed from the bondage of this. It's a greed. And greed, by the way, it says is idolatry. That's right. And the Lord becomes your desire. How can you do that? You can't. Listen. You can't do it. No, but you, you also, you can't get out. You cannot get to a place unless you go be a hermit living in a desert, where you're not going to see the advertising, where you're not going to be, you're not going to have people pressuring you, whether it's advertising or peer pressure. I mean, you know, that's, that's another form of uh, marketing is when you, when you see your teenage kids go to school and they have to have a certain pair of jeans because all the other kids were wearing those kind of jeans, you know, they're, they're building that pressure to consume, to buy these things. What happens when those things become unimportant to you? How, do, how can you get, you can't get away from the physical reality of being confronted with this continually. Right. What you can do is choose to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. What you can do is choose to set your mind on the things above rather than the things of the earth. Now, is that a challenge? Of course it is. That's why Paul said that there's this constant Power conflict between the flesh, between the flesh and, the spirit. and the spirit. That's why, what's the difference between this lust that he talks about and the desire that he talks about? It's the same word. One is of the flesh, one is of the spirit. One has to decrease. Right. But, but, but when, it's, when it's of the flesh, it's a lust. That's right. That's and that has that, that negative... Is, yeah. When it's of the spirit, it's a desire. It's a passion. But it's a passionate desire. Okay? So that's the place we have to choose to get to. How do you get there? Well, practice. Same Take thoughts captive to the obedience of... Listening uh, to the Lord. Listening to the Lord. Spending time in the Word. Making the right choices. Getting in the habit. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're not going to fall. Doesn't mean that you... And by the way, to see something and your immediate reaction is, boy, I wish I had one of those. That's not sin. No, that's not lust. That's not lust. We've been through that, We've been through that whole thing. Sense. with Yes. Look, like, like linger, linger, lust. Okay? Yeah. So, you know, you have to... If you missed that, by the way, go back and watch some of the Bible studies, and somewhere in there you'll find that. Mm -hmm. And that is a process. Well, we have to go through this process of being transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's, right. That's what Paul says. You have to do this. Okay? All right, so do it. Okay. Here's something interesting. Is that Paul says, you know, he wanted to come to us, to get back to Thessalonians, mm -hmm. more than once, but he said, and yet Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. Jesus told the apostles, told the disciples, he said, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Yeah. Got that? Mm -hmm. We have authority to do that. Yes. Um, Alice and I came back from our travels last month. And one of the places, you know, we spent a lot of time in Leeds in England, going back and forth to, to Leeds where we were blessed to be able to participate in growing a ministry there of dear brothers and sisters Des and Lynn Harper yep. in Hi. Leeds, England, uh, who we've been in contact with on a regular basis since we got back. But they started with a, a Bible study in their house, and now, I mean, that's expanding, and, and God is just blessing that. But we've talked to them numerous times since we've gotten back, and every time we talk to them, they're under attack. Yes. They're under attack. I mean, they've been under attack physically, financially, with their kids. It's just a constant barrage. So every time I talk to Des or Lynn, and they tell me this, I said, praise God. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, you may not think that's the right reaction. Well, of course it's the right reaction. The Word of God says, you know, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Why? Because I know that Des has stepped on the tail of the serpent. You know, I've shared this here before. Alice and I lived, as a matter of fact, Mark was for a while down in Central America, in Belize, Central America. And we lived out in the bush. And we, you know, this was a place where there's a lot of snakes. There are dangerous snakes there. And one of the things that I learned, being a city boy, was that by and large, you leave snakes alone, they leave you alone. I mean, they, you know, 
by, you know, most snakes, a rattlesnake, he's not going to eat you. No. So they, they strike human beings out of defense when they think that they're in danger. I mean, it, you know, they're not, they're not they're biting you. They, they feel threatened, right? When they feel threatened, they strike. That's right. You leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Well, trust me. When Jesus gave them authority to tread on serpents, he was giving them an order to tread on serpents. Right. Des and Lynn and Leeds have been stepping on the serpent. Yes. And he's been responding by striking. Okay? Paul was constantly mm. stepping on the devil. Do you know, you know the story in the book of Acts about the seven sons of Sceva? Mm -hmm. There were these, Sceva was a, a Jewish priest, and he had these seven sons. And they had heard about what was going on and seen what was going on with the power of God working through Paul and the disciples. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying, they were going around casting out, trying to cast out demons. And they went in to try and cast out a demon. And this demon said to them, I recognize Jesus. You know why they recognize Jesus? Because all these demons are fallen angels who had been there. I thought it was, I know Jesus, I recognize Paul. No. No? no. It's the opposite? Okay. It's a rec they recognize Jesus because they had seen him face to face. They recognize him. They don't know, it's not knowing about him. They, they recognize, recognize him. Hey, so, so this demon says to these seven guys, I, you know, we recognize Jesus and we know about Paul. Know about. But who are you? And then proceeds to beat the pulp out of them. Pulp out of them. How did they know about Paul? Now, he, this demon, this is a demon, mm -hmm. and he says, I know about Paul. He hadn't encountered Paul. No. no Otherwise, he would recognize him. Exactly. How do you think he knew about Paul? This is my hypothesis. Let's hear it. Because when the demons get together at the demon parties, mm -hmm. The word's going around, oh boy, you better watch out for this guy, Paul. He is trouble. You better watch out for this guy, Paul. He is trouble. He doesn't come when he comes. He's looking for a fight. He had How a many reputation. Of us? He had a reputation. He had a reputation with the Lord. Praise God. He had a reputation with men. Paul had a reputation with demons. And I believe they were scared to death of him. Okay, and that's why they're always attacking him throughout his ministry. I mean, you look, we looked at this when we started this letter. You know, he's moving from place to place because of the satanic attacks against him. Well, it says in verse 18 that Satan thwarted us. That is an interesting word. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, go ahead. Be because we can, God has a plan for your life. And Paul, it, Paul, it, Paul it enabled people to redirect their life to the way God wanted their life to go. Okay, let me ask you a question. Now, well, Satan no, 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 has no, 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 a plan. Let me ask you a question. And when, let me ask you a question. Okay. Your Bible says thwart? Thwart. Thwart. And yours says too. Okay, one of the things I said in the beginning, that we're, we're all using the New American Standard. I happen to be using the New American Standard that was revised in 1995. They're using an older version of the New American Standard mm -hmm. because this says hindered, doesn't say doesn't say thwart. Mm -hmm. and it, What's the difference between those? Well, words? let me just go into that, right? Because it, there is um, to hinder somebody means to make it more difficult. To thwart makes it impossible. Yes, so that's a difference, right? Okay. But I want to talk about them being, you know, Paul being hindered by the devil. But let me stay on point just a second about Paul's reputation and everything. Mm -hmm. Why did Paul have this reputation? Why did he have this reputation with men? Why did Paul have a reputation with, with, remember, Paul had a reputation when he got saved. Damn, uh, in the early church, the early church didn't want anything to do with Paul <clears throat> because he had a reputation because he went out and persecuted the church. If you want to talk about God making a difference in somebody's life, what a difference he's made in my life, look at Paul. Paul went from persecuting Christians to, to being used of God to create Christians. Right? Think about this. This is just in, in Acts 
17, chapter 6, when he went into the Salonica, okay, when he went into this town the first time, it says when, remember he went into the synagogues and he started preaching, he was there for three weeks since he was preaching, and the whole town got in an uproar. Why did it get an uproar? Because the Jews that were there who rejected the Messiah got jealous of Paul, and they tried to create a problem. So they went out looking for. It says, the Jews who rejected the Messiah gathered a mob from the marketplace and went looking for Paul and, and Silvanus or Silas, right? Mm -hmm. And here's what it says. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men, now they're talking about Paul, right? Mm -hmm. These men have turn, who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Mine says they have upset the world. Yeah, well, what does it mean to upset? If you have a glass of water and you upset it, you turn it upside down. It says in the King James and most other translations, turned upside down. Paul turned the world upside down. That was his reputation. He had a reputation with the demons. He had a reputation with ungodly people. He turned the world upside down. How many Christians today are are turning the world upside down? Well, maybe we go out and we build buildings and we get television and radio ministries or internet ministries. But are we turning the world upside down? Are, are we in a place where we are, should you be rejoicing because you're being attacked by the devil? Well, if you're not being attacked by the devil, let me go back to what I said before. It's fine because you're not bothering. He feels no threat. Now, are we supposed to go out looking for trouble? No. no. We are supposed to go out looking for opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. In the process, I want to tell you something, because those people who don't know Jesus Christ, guess what? It says that they are, they are enslaved in bondage to the devil. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. That's what it says. Yes. So they're surrounded by the devil. If you're going to get to them, you've got to get through the devil. And when you start stepping on the devil, and I'm not talking about these lovely picnics where we invite, invite a friend to church. I'm talking about when you go out and get in the face, face. of unbelievers, mm -hmm. proclaiming the love of God, speaking the truth in love. You're going to be standing on serpents while you do that. Right. And when you're standing on the serpents, you're going to be striking. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to take the attack that comes for following Jesus Christ? That's something that's not talked about very much in the church today. I can remember not, not very long ago, we were in England, and I went in, I think, in Oldham, in, Ma in the Manchester area, and I was preaching a sermon. And I said to people, I said, you know, if you, if you had to describe, you know, what, what is it to follow Jesus Christ? Um, Fill in the blank. The, um, what word would you, yeah. Now, what word do you use? Okay. And, of course, people came following up with, Following Jesus Christ is. is Fill in the blank. And, you know, there were lots of responses and everything. I said, well, the word I'm thinking about is following Jesus Christ is dangerous. You know the song, what a friend we have in Jesus. Hallelujah, what a friend we have in Jesus. But when you make a friend of Jesus Christ, you have made, made an enemy. You have made a foe. Right. This is not a joke. This is the reality of spiritual warfare. And I'm not talking about just little, some little sermon on spiritual warfare or some conference on spirit. I am talking about the reality. You know, it's one thing to study warfare, or now, uh, I, I sidetrack myself. I, I saw on television in the news the other day, no, I didn't see it on television, I saw it on the news on the internet, talking about what a multi cabillion dollar industry these warfare video oh, games video have become games. and how competitive they are. I mean, literally, you know, a couple of these warfare, shoot em up shooter games, they call them, have, have sold basically $20 billion. Wow. I mean, they, they, they're outselling the biggest movies ever made. This isn't vicarious. It's not a game. It's not sitting at a computer playing war. This is the reality of warfare. When you are going out and serving Jesus Christ, if you think that you will not arouse the ire of the enemy, you have thunk wrong. Because it brings about the battle. It brings about the battle. Be prepared. Don't, don't be unaware that, uh, you know, 
the, the devil, the schemes of the devil. Don't be unaware of the fact that, you know, we know that he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. This, this is a real thing. All right? So, Paul, because he had that willingness and he was, had the courage to go into this battle, he turned the world upside down. Paul had a heart like David's. Think about this. You know this story. At a place in the Valley of Succoth. In, in English, it's called the Valley of uh, Oak Valley, the Valley of Allah in Hebrew. You know, the Philistines had come to the valley, and the people of God, the army of God, had gathered on one side of the valley, and the Philistines on the other side, and their champion, Goliath, comes out. Well, everybody knows the story, David and Goliath, right? Well, for a 40 days and 40 nights, this monstrous Philistine comes out and challenges the people of God. They play church. They have gathered in their battle array, they're shouting war cries, but nobody is engaging the enemy. Nobody's engaging the enemy. Were they taunting or not even that? They were getting taunted. They were getting taunted. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, they refused to engage the enemy. And then comes along a shepherd boy named David. David went onto the battlefield, I'm sure you know the story, but here's what he said. David said to the Philistines, you come to me with a sword, a spirit, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. This is a man after God's own heart. What was his heart? This is the heart of David. Engage the enemy. Now when I talk about engage the enemy, I'm not talking about, okay, let's go out and attack you know, I am talking about, because our, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. I am talking about spiritual warfare. The way you do warfare with the devil is to go at, after the people that he has captured. And how do you deal with them? In love. Bringing them the message of God the Father's love expressed in Jesus Christ hung on a cross. And when you do that, if you are doing this in reality, and again, I'm not talking about just having, you know, by the way, we're having hot dogs at our church this weekend, come visit. I'm talking about going out into the world, because that's what the gospel said. We're to go out into the highways and byways. We are to go out. We are to go out and make disciples of all nations, go out, out into all the world. We are to go out and engage the enemy. We're not to stand on the hill. We're not to sit in our buildings, our little castles, and wait for them to come to us. We're to go out and attack. We attack the enemy by reaching out to lost souls. Paul got in the devil's face and turned the world upside down. That's a fact. How are we doing? And the, the physical warfare that's taken place is through the, the angels, right? Michael. And... There, is, there is spiritual warfare. Yeah. And, and, I think this is part of the problem, is that we're not appraising things spiritually. You know, it says, Paul wrote and to the Corinthians, it said, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually appraised. The spiritual man appraises all things. We're supposed to look at things through the Word of God, a spiritual appraisal. And we would understand that what's going on. You know, everything becomes, right now, and here in the United States of America, everything becomes political. And you hear all the commentaries about Occupy Wall Street, whatever's going on. And it has a political and natural appraisal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are, listen to me, I don't, I'm going to just say this, I, I don't agree with what, Occupy Wall Street. I don't. No. How, having said that, let me say this. I agree that there are people out there who are hurting, 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 yes. and they don't have any answers. And the people that they have looked to receive answers from have failed them miserably because the people that they're depending on that come up with the answers don't have the answers. I don't care who gets elected in the next election, they're not going to have the answers because the answers aren't found where they're looking. I've got the answers here and this is the only place you're going to find the answers is in the Word of God. Those people need to be reached with the love of Jesus Christ. There is no political solution. Listen to me. There is no political solution to a spiritual problem. And every political problem 
has only a spiritual solution. Now, Paul was hindered, hindered from getting to places you want. You know, Paul had a thorn in his flesh, he talks about, that he went before the Lord and said, pray to God, remove this thorn from me. Three times he prayed, three times God answered the prayer. No. Each time the prayer was, the answer was the same, no. And why? Paul says, well, so he wouldn't exalt himself. Right? So he would remain, you know, if any man had reason to not be humble, and I put quotes around this, it was the Apostle Paul. And he goes through this. Well, because, because God worked through this man in incredible, incredible power. I mean, everywhere he went, God was working through him. And because of that, that's why the enemy is coming against him. So now the question becomes thwarting. This is, let me jump ahead. Isaiah. This is from Isaiah. God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and said, devise a plan. Now he's talking to the enemies of God. That's right. He says to them, you, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. The devil makes plans to destroy you. The devil makes plans to take you away from the path of God. The devil makes plans. He is against you. Jesus said this to Peter. The devil is against you. He wants you. But I've got you in the, you know, the Father has you in the palm of his hand where no man can snatch you out. Right? The fact is, sometimes, God uses the devil. Remember the devil is a tool. Yeah, the devil's a tool. Let me give you one idea. Yes. There's, there's one thing you need to know about the devil. He is, and you may want to write this down, stupid. Absolutely the most stupid being that has ever existed. Hell was made specifically for him because of his stupidity. What was his stupidity? He stood in the presence of God Almighty and rebelled against him. So he devised his plan, but God uses him like a tool. Alice has mentioned David in two places. He says, you know, that when he numbered the people of God, he said that the, that, that the anger of the Lord caused him to number the people of God. And then in the same passage in Chronicles, it says that Satan caused him. Does God use Satan? Does God take the stupidity of Satan, who's always trying to do things to hurt the church, and turn them around to serve his own purpose. Well, that's what it's saying in Isaiah. And that's what Paul knew when he wrote to the Corinthians and said, not the Corinthians, the Romans, you silly, and said, we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So Satan devises these plans, but God uses them for his own purpose. It's one thing, Paul can say that he was hindered. I'm, I'm going to say this, and, and you pray about this. God used Satan's attacks to direct the path of Paul. Paul wanted to go places. It says, don't lean on your own understanding. And Paul was not leaning on his own understanding, but he had his own... He, brother, I want to tell you something. Well, no, but Paul had desires. He wanted to get out. I, I think that Paul, if he could have gotten... An, you know, I mean, just gotten a go-kart and driven around faster so he could get to more people, he would have done it. It says he wanted to reach people with the, cro with the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. So he wanted to go here and he wanted to go there and all of a sudden Satan hindered him so he went here instead. He wanted to go here but Satan hindered him so he went here. Is that God using the devil to kind of create and... and um, Direct his yeah. Yes. I, you know, I, I'm not an expert on sheepdogs or anything, although we had a dear he friend. We had a Dear, we have dear friends in New York, Bob and Pam Rizzoni, Hi. <laughs> who had years ago a, a, an Australian sheepdog. Nice. Oh, Sophia, dear Sophie. Sophia. What a pain that dog was. She would nip at your heels. She'd nip at your heels. But that's what she did. That's how they heard them? That's right. Okay. She was trying to herd people? Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. She was a herder. She yeah. would try and herd people. But that's, you know, the sheepdogs, they kind of nip at your heels to get you to go where they want. Well, God, you, and you know what? The shepherd controlled the sheepdog. That's right. Not the sheepdog. Right. It's like, the, it's almost like the Lord is using 
the sheepdog nip at your heels to get you to go in this direction because he wants mm -hmm. you to go there. Yeah. All right? You know, not I, as I said, Alice and I this year we spent a lot of time out in the road traveling around the world. It had been our expressed desire when we left here. We had been talking to a lot of pastors, been in communication with a lot of pastors in Pakistan. And when we left here, we had planned on going to Pakistan. It was our desire to go to Pakistan, uh, regardless of the political situation there. And we met with the Consul General of the Pakistani Embassy in London, as a matter of fact. And at the end of the day, um, they refused to allow us into the country. They denied our visa application. And a lot of strange things were going on there. I mean, just that's neither here nor there, but a lot of strange things were going on. So did the devil hinder our plans to go to Pakistan? Well, I, I, don't have any, I don't have any problem with that statement. But then when we couldn't go to Pakistan, in the night, the Lord said to me, will you go someplace where the, where the gospel is even less. less received? And he directed us someplace less else. Less receptive to the gospel. Where they're less receptive to the gospel than Pakistan. So instead of going to, to, to Pakistan, we went to another country. God used that situation, and you know we had perfect we had perfect peace about that mm -hmm. because people are telling me you can't go to Pakistan, you can't go to Pakistan. Yeah, God said, Listen, wants us to go. You know, we go. I, you know, I mean, this is around the same time that they got Bin Laden and you know all the things, and the situation with Pakistan has been going downhill very rapidly between the U.S. and Pakistan, and it's like if God doesn't want us to go. He'll close that door because Jesus Christ made it clear in the book of Revelation that it is he who has the key of David who opens doors that no man can close who, you know so if that door closed it was because the Lord shut the door not he may have used Satan as a tool to try and hinder us but what it did is it directed us to where God wanted us to be and that's why you have to know that all things work together for good that's why you have to know God's not out of control and you know he's not losing this battle right he has not lost one battle. No, not ever. He never. All right? Never. So, don't feel bad if in your faithful approach to the Lord, things are going wrong. Know that you're stepping on the devil's tail. You know, it's, it's supposed to be that when you're stirring up trouble for the devil, he's going to attack. Don't let that put you off. You know, what's comforting about this also is the fact that you know that God is orchestrating things to do and use you the way he wants. Absolutely. So. And by the way, um, I, I know I've told you here, on our Bible Talk website every day, we post, Alice posts actually, a Bible verse. We have a verse of the day, mm -hmm. which corresponds to the date, by the way. Yes. So today, as we're doing this live, being October 28th, the verse comes from 1028. And in this case, it happens to be Matthew 1028, mm -hmm. which is Jesus is instructing us, don't feel fear those who kill the body. Don't be afraid. You know, I've said this, I, I went into so many churches and said, you know, do you believe that God wants to bless you as much as he possibly can? Mm -hmm. And everybody's hand shoots straight up. Yeah, absolutely. And I said, well, that's a, uh, I will disabuse you of that foolishness. Because if God wanted to bless you as much as he possibly could right now. You know, a bolt of lightning or a North Korean bomb or something would come right through our roof and we'd go fizz straight into the throne room of God. That's what Paul said, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Mm -hmm. God hasn't blessed us as much as he possibly can by taking us away because he has purpose for our lives here. What's the purpose of our lives here? Serve God. To encourage one another, to serve one another in love, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's first of all, to the household of God. Mm -hmm. That we need to be a blessing to one another, praying for one another, encouraging one another, strengthening one another, being used in the ministry in the body of Christ, and then reaching out to the world, to a lost and dying world with the good news of Jesus Christ. When we do that, it's going, to, it's going to create a problem. Because the devil's not going to give up his hold on this world easily. When Jesus comes back riding on that white horse, there's a war coming. Right? He's too stupid to just surrender. He's too stupid to just walk off and jump into hell. He's going to get thrown into that fiery lake. He said something interesting in that fast paragraph. His world because this world is in the hands of the evil. That's what it says. New Testament, by the way. Right. New Testament. We know that this present world is in the power of the evil. Okay. Let's, let's just go on. Verse 19, right? I'm going to read verse 19 and 20. Okay. 
For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. This is Paul speaking to those believers who have accepted the Lord through his ministry. Right? Mm -hmm. And he's saying that you are our hope, you are our joy in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming. Well, you know, my hope is set upon the Lord. Hallelujah. And it says in, I think it's Philippians, so, uh, I may be wrong, that the joy of the Lord uh, is set. I just, it just went right out of my head. That, the, that we are the joy of the Lord. Okay, we're going to, we'll get somewhere near there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Am I saying it right? No, but they're close. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, but, but the point is, I mean, you know, the, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Is Paul contradicting that by saying that these believers are his joy and his, and his hope? No, the fact is they go together. He says at the coming of the Lord, it's, it's going to be that way. Why? Because this is the sign of the fulfillment of his ministry. This is a sign of God working through him. What gives him joy is to see people receiving the great gift of God the Father, Jesus Christ. Paul said, I determined and know nothing but Christ and him crucified. This is the message that he preached. This is what he did. This was the purpose of his life. You know, it says, those who call upon, this is Paul writing. It says, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how will they call upon the name of the Lord if they haven't heard? How will they hear if it's not been preached? How is it preached? Unless somebody sent. So God is sending him. He is fulfilling his ministry, being used by the hand of God. And this is what gives him joy, to see the effect of God working through him. What brings you joy? Oh, we just talked a few minutes ago about desire. What are the things you desire in this world? What brings you joy in this world? It, it, it's really interesting because as I was praying about this today, I'm thinking to myself, you know what brings people a lot, a lot of people joy? And come Friday, this is we do these on Friday live, so today is Friday. People get through work, whatever, 5 o'clock on Friday, and they go out and have a cold beer in a bar, and this is what gives them joy. You know, this Friday afternoon, you know, the worldly expression, thank God it's Friday. And I'm thinking, well, that's pretty silly, because that's not the joy that the Lord wants us to have. And it surely isn't attached to a bottle of beer or to a particular day, because this is the day the Lord has made. So as I'm thinking about that, I realize that the pastor of the biggest church in the United States of America has just written a book. Uh, I, I don't even know what the name of the book is, but that was, I went to it. And it was like, okay, who wants to make every day like Friday? That's the, the purpose. So you have that same joy as you get from. Well, that, bro, that doesn't come from a feeling like that. No. Where does your joy come from? Just because you're getting off from work or because your you're team won? Uh, because the basketball season, which is looking bad, gets reinstated? Or your team wins the world? What brings you joy? Jesus. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. It says, let a man examine himself. This is not a game. This is not, you know, God searches the heart. Think of him searching your heart right now. What brings you joy? I want to read you some scripture verses. David, a man after God's own heart, said, In your presence is fullness of joy. Being in the presence of God. That's, that's Psalm 1611. That should bring you the fullness of joy. John, right? John the Baptist, when, he, when his mother Elizabeth was pregnant with him, and Mary, pregnant with Jesus, walks through the door. Here's what Elizabeth said, For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. This is, I mean, this is John the Baptist in the womb, Jesus Christ in the womb. When Mary walks into the room, John the Baptist leaps for joy. In the presence of Jesus. In the presence of, in the presence of God is the fullness of joy. John the Baptist would later say, "He who has the or said of him, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. Hearing the voice of God should bring you joy." Jesus said. In the same way I tell you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It's not about 
names added to their congregation list. But when one sinner repents, all the angels in heaven rejoice. How do we get that kind of joy? Do we have a heart for the lost? The Apostle John said, For I was glad when the brethren came and testified to your truth, that how you are walking in truth, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. That's him writing to Gaius in his third letter. These are the things that Paul shared. Joy that comes from being in the presence of God. Joy that comes from hearing the voice of God. Joy that comes from seeing sinners repent and be saved. Joy that comes from hearing of those children in the Lord walking in the truth. You have a ministry. Oh, maybe you don't have a collar, maybe you don't have a seminary or cemetery degree, but you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a ministry. Whatever that ministry is, because the Spirit of God, Paul said, works through each individual, every individual, every believer, just as he wills. Your joy should come from the presence of God working in and through your life. If it comes from something else, then you better go back and remember that verse that I quoted way back in the beginning of the study tonight about the gold of Ophir. If you're getting your joy from the things of the world, the world and the things of the world, it's going to fail you because it's a lie. It makes promises. The world makes promises that it cannot keep. But God watches over his word to perform it. And no promise that he has promised has ever failed to come to pass. Paul, seeing those who had believed through his ministry, what greater reward or joy can there be? In Hebrews it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for whom, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what I was looking for. Hebrews 12, 2. That's what you're looking yeah, for. The joy okay. set before him. What joy was set before him? I've heard people say, well, well, he was going back to heaven. Well, listen, that's silly if you stop and think about it. He had that joy. He left that behind. That's not what he was. He wasn't trying to get back, you know, rush back to where he was. He came here for a purpose. The purpose was you. You were the purpose he came. The purpose was me. The purpose was Mark. The purpose was Alice. He came to take away our sins so that we would be, have a right relationship with God the Father. Where did he do that? He did it on the cross. He went to the cross for the joy set before him. You are the joy of Jesus Christ. You are the joy of God the Father. You are precious in his sight, it says in Isaiah 43. This is real. And there's a real battle going on. What drives your life? What drives your life? You know, stop and think. Be honest with yourself. I don't say this for condemnation. I'm trying to encourage you to think. Do you believe this or don't you really believe it? Are you playing at Christianity? Or are you a disciple of Jesus Christ, led by his spirit and by his word? What's the reality of this thing? Because if you're driven by the things of the world, you're missing the mark and it will fail you and you will have no joy. The only place you get joy is from the Spirit of God. It's a gift of the Holy and Spirit. And you'll have that joy through the persecutions, through the tribulations. It'll never leave you. Every single writer in the New Testament. I mean, think about it. Paul, James, John, Peter. They taught Jesus, it's written about Jesus over and over in the four Gospels, that these things, these trials, these tribulations, what do they result in? They result in glory and honor at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter says. They, they result in building character and hope in you, Paul says. Mm -hmm. They result in bringing glory to God, Peter says. They result in good things. That's right. Satan may come against you, but God thwarts his purpose and accomplishes his own purpose in your life through these things. It wasn't the devil who came up with the idea of attacking Job. No. It was God said to the devil, have, have you, you considered, considered my servant Job? Why? Because he wanted to bring harm to Job? No. No. Of course not. Because Job said in that book, he said, I know that when I have been tried, I shall come forth as fine gold. 
God uses these things, these trials, these tribulations, these, all of these things that go on in our life to accomplish his purpose. And his greatest purpose is to refine you and to make you what you ought to be here so you can accomplish his purpose. And his purpose here is to bring glory to his own name. Let me just say one thing. Everybody knows this verse, Psalm 23. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his, his name's, name's sake. Right. Every creator, you, know, you have artists and sculptors, and they, they have a masterpiece. And our creator has created a masterpiece. Thank you very much. I, I accept that compliment but gracefully. We are. We are his masterpiece. Yes, you are. You are. Want to know something? If, if we could grasp these are truths that if we could really get a hold of, it would change everything in our lives. And look at how in the world, masterpieces, what, what do they do to protect them? They, in the elements, they put them in you know, places where that nothing will harm them or come against them. And that's what he, he, but he does that with us. We may not feel like it, but it's true. I mean, he does. He puts us in situations. No, no, I, he says he, we're, we're sealed. Where the right. stuff from the world is so spiritual. That's it. I mean, I have a, I have, no, no, because I have a picture um, that I took in one of our many trips to, to Paris to minister. The, the one time we got to go to the Louvre. Oh, yes. And, and I have a picture of Alice standing next to the Mona Lisa. Not right next to the Mona Lisa, you because you can't this. get no, right no. next to the Mona Lisa. You know, I mean, it is, it is well guarded, it is protected. You can only get to a certain distance. And by the way, Alice is, turn and look at the camera. Alice is much cuter than the Mona Lisa. Take that, take that. Okay. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, while, while all of these tourists are jostling around and jostling Alice while I'm trying to get a picture of her around the Mona Lisa, which is well protected, let me tell you, Alice is much more protected than the Mona Lisa is. That's right. That's right. She's much more protected because she is much more precious than the Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. Listen to what I tell you because I'm going to tell you a truth. And this is a lovely, wonderful truth. Long, long, long after the Mona Lisa is gone, dust or ashes, right. well after the Louvre, that incredible building that houses the Mona Lisa, is well, dust or ashes, after, long after they're gone, Alice will exist in the presence of God because she is protected sealed and precious in the sight of God. Amen. So are you. That's right. And that's a, that's a joy. That's why, in spite of all of the trials and tribulations, that's why Jesus can say, don't fear those who kill the body. Because it's not about this time, it's not about this life, it's about eternity. God spoke through Solomon to say, mm -hmm. and said that he has set eternity on our hearts. When you start to have an eternal perspective, yes. Then you will start to treasure the things above. Then you will start to, your desires will become spiritual rather than carnal. And that's the choice. It's carnal or spiritual. Okay? I think uh, the carnal mind, it's uh, the Greek word is sarx. Yeah. Yeah. Like Sarcophagus. Well, it comes from that, but it always makes me think of dirty sarx. Got dirty sarx on? Okay. All right. I'm going to just read uh, going into the to the third chapter here. Okay. Uh, I think we'll have to end there. But in the beginning of the third chapter says this, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. So Paul, in the midst of this, when he can't get back, to the church at Thessalonians, uh, the Thessalonians. Now he's sending them back. Okay, that's where we'll pick this up again next week. Please be with us. Invite others to join us. And until we're there, I want to encourage you. If you have questions or comments, um, just like to say hello to us. Let us know where you're watching from. Write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We would love to hear from you. And until then, I'm going to zoom in and say, Father, we just thank you, thank you for the gift of your word. And I pray that you would just open the eyes of our hearts and we would see wonderful things in your word. Above all, Father, we thank you for the word made flesh, your son, Christ Jesus, who has brought this gift of salvation to us 
through his atoning work on the cross. Lord, help us to be focused and fixed on you to set our mind on the things above. Help us to desire you above all. And we just praise you and thank you that we can do that in Jesus' name. Until next time, God bless you, and may you be used for the glory of God. Is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word is a light into my path. Your word is a lamp into my feet. Help me.